What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of Behind the Facade. If you are a long-time listener of this show, you will notice a slight change to the usual format. Where has the cool theme music gone, you might be thinking? Well, don't worry, it is going to be here in a moment, and I will explain everything inside the episode. Today, I am going to be taking a deep dive into how your mindset and your emotions can negatively impact your investment decisions and behavior. This is especially during times of economic uncertainty, which I think you will all agree we are currently in these days. So guys, buckle up as we dive into the episode. What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of Behind the Facade. I'm your host, Gavin J. Gallagher, and on this podcast, I explore the mental and emotional game often playing out subconsciously in your mind and the mind of everyone else in the real estate or property investment market. The key to success in this game is to master your mindset, your behavior, to take control of your thoughts, your emotions, and most importantly, your ego. Welcome to the show. All right, guys, welcome back to the show. This is episode number 75. Now, the first thing I want to do is just address the format change, and that is the one that the longtime listeners will all be wondering what's going on, and you will have noticed a little bit of a change in the introduction. Well, as I mentioned last week, I have been in the process of migrating the podcast from Anchor over to Libsyn, and I am delighted to report that the process is now complete and has been successful. And I am particularly pleased because I've been looking at the data and it is telling me that quite a few new listeners have joined the audience. And so if you have just discovered the podcast in the last week or so, a very, very warm welcome to you all. I hope you'll sort of stay in the community here with all of my longtime listeners. And as a way of marking the occasion of not just the 75th episode of the podcast, but also welcoming all of you new listeners in, I thought I would sort of upgrade the format a little. So let me know if you like it and do you hate it? Let me know as well. Please kind of get in contact with me via the Facebook group. If you want to join the Facebook group, it's called Behind the Facade Community. There'll be a link in the show notes. Or you can contact me directly through social media. My handle is Gavin J. Gallagher, and I am quite literally everywhere on the Internet using that handle, including my YouTube channel. Anyway, let's get into the show. I don't know about you guys, but I have spent the week watching live coverage of the volcano that is going off in the La Palma Islands. And it's pretty mesmerizing. I think you'll agree. I've been watching the lava flows during the night and stuff, and it's just incredible with, you know, to watch the the power of nature at work. But you got to also take a moment to kind of think about the poor people who've lost their homes and in some cases their livelihoods as this lava has kind of been pouring out of this mountain. And, you know, there's some homes now sitting under kind of 20 meters of lava so that's it like they'll never be seen again and can you imagine if you were in that position or indeed if your business has just been wiped out because of this and and maybe it's not you know underneath lava maybe it's just simply that the you know the island economy is now going to collapse as a result of the volcano going off and so it's going to be a while before you're back on so obviously my my thoughts go out to those guys that are so badly affected like that but this thought actually got me thinking about how we deal with economic uncertainty and various other challenges in our life. And so I thought what I'll do right now is go into that today. And um, so let's just kind of take a little moment to kind of think about what is going on in the world right now. On the one hand, we have lots of encouraging signs. We've got economic activity is booming. Here in the in Ireland, the, the, the finance department have come up and said that they expect the economy to grow by two uh, by 5.25% this year and for GDP to increase by 15.6%, which is incredible. It's, it's, um, and then it's well needed as well, given we're coming out of this COVID shock and uh, we've all, you know, the borrowings and things like that have gone through the roof for the government. House prices are also shooting up. And uh, you've also got the labor market is doing very well, although some people might not be too happy about it. But I imagine lorry drivers and bricklayers are all very, very pleased with their lot at the moment because they've all seen big, big pay increases in the last 12 months or so. 
Uh, then on the other hand, we have an awful lot of negative news that is quite concerning to read. For example, I've been reading about you know this Chinese property company Evergrande, which is on the verge of collapse and uh, unable to pay its debts, which are now at 300 billion. Then closer to home in the UK, you've got these service stations or petrol stations that have got queues down the road and they just don't have any petrol or diesel. And also in the supermarkets, you've got, you know, empty shelves and stuff like that. And back here at home in Ireland, we have warnings about the Christmas, you know, run up to Christmas actually being problematic now because of the supply chain issues. And not to mention what we're noticing, what I personally am noticing in my own uh, site that we have here in Dublin that we're building. And the, it's just crazy, the, the, the increases in the labor costs. You know, we, we had initially budgeted on 125 per block for block layers, and it's shot up now and it's, it's above two euro. And so, you know, huge increases in labor costs have been quite kind of unexpected. And then we've also got material shortages. Suddenly things are going to take 12 weeks to get to us, whereas we had expected them to be next day delivery. All of this stuff has led to a slowdown. And we basically, we, at the moment, we more or less expect that we were about two months behind. And the question is, what lies ahead? You know, how many more you know delays are going to cause us to get further and further behind? And what should we be budgeting for in terms of when we'll actually start selling these? Then I'm reading in the newspaper that the global supply chain is actually in crisis at the moment. And it's something I'm certainly seeing. I mean, I, I understand the cost of shipping containers now. If you want to get something shipped from China, the price of a shipping container has gone up by seven uh, times. And so it's seven times what it cost, you know, last year. And so there are shortages everywhere because of this. And so what's going on, guys? Like, I mean, it's just crazy at the moment. And all of these mixed signals create huge amount of uncertainty. And you kind of wonder, should I be doing one thing or should I be doing the other? Like, what is the signal that you need to kind of prepare for? And so I'm going to go and take a bit of a dive into this. And I'm going to give you what my take is and what's happening now. And remember, this is just my opinion. You know, I've made mistakes before and back in the lockdown last year, I was predicting that house prices were going to fall. So this may all be wrong, but I do have my views and I'm going to share them with you today. And then after I've given you my views, I'm going to tell you what I think is likely to happen as a result of what's going on at the moment. And then what you can possibly expect to see over the next 12 to 18 months. And then finally, I'm going to be going into my view on how you can protect yourself and how you should be thinking right now and behaving to protect yourself from any potential fallout. So starting with the, you know, the massive demand that we're all seeing, the pent up demand, what's happened, obviously, it's, it's kind of clear to us all that in March of 2020, we went into the first global lockdown. And here we are 18 months later, and we're just starting to kind of come out of it. And as we're coming out of it, there has been, you know, obviously there's been rolling kind of openings and closings and restrictions have been brought in and then taken away and then brought in again. And there's been mixed, you know, responses across the world. But the end result is that most of the developed world have, you know, all of the governments basically borrowed trillions and trillions of dollars, pounds, euros, whatever, to protect their economies from certain collapse. If you had allowed, you know, during that lockdown period, if that if they had not been a putting out supports and you know furlough schemes and all of these protections there is no doubt that millions of people would have been laid off and businesses would have shut down and it would have been a total economic disaster so what they did was the right thing to do i think that's clear and uh, literally trillions have been sort of borrowed and trillions have been given out to the population in order to kind of allow them to survive. If you're if you were put on furlough, you're sitting at home and all of this stuff has led to the uncertainty has led to people saving more, not spending much. And what it's done is it's created this pent up demand. It's created this kind of savings bubble. And, you know, no one has apart from the likes of Amazon, very few people have seen huge spending going on. I mean, it's great if you're an online commerce business, but hotels, travel, restaurants, gyms, you know, all of that stuff have gone through hell because they have been shut down for the last 18 months now. 
And this has led to huge amounts of money being saved by certain people that are sitting at home. And then in other cases, you know, businesses are you know struggling. But what we have now is this unusual uncertainty where you have businesses on one hand struggling. And on the other hand, you have millions and millions and, you know, saved up in consumer uh, savings. You got people sitting at home, sitting on a big bank balance because they've been because of the uncertainty. They've been cautious. They've been saving their money just in case something happens and they need it. And then suddenly, as the restrictions are coming back and the economy looks now to be booming and prices are rising and uh, labor prices are going up, all of this, there's a sudden kind of sigh of relief and everyone's kind of going, oof, now we can kind of start thinking about spending that nice big savings account that we've built up. And so 18 months later, suddenly it has been released. The pressure has been released and everyone, it's a little bit like if you think about when you're opening a, a big bottle of Coca-Cola and you open that lid too quickly, the whole thing will fizz up and kind of more or less explode and spray everywhere. And it's very, very similar uh, thing is happening here. Suddenly, 18 months of saving, of restrictions, of all of this stuff, people are now ready to kind of go back to normal and they've got the money saved up and it's like a stampede. Everyone wants to go out and spend holiday prices. Spending has shut up. Orders have shut up. Demand is up. You've got it. You know, restaurants are reporting that they're kind of completely full. You've got flights are all getting booked up and prices are rising. I've been checking. I've been looking for a hotel for a, a holiday and the prices have all shot up just recently. And so what happens when there's so much demand? Well, obviously, it forces suppliers to start, you know, their production. They actually say, think to themselves, geez, we have to go and respond to all of this extra you know, demand that's there. So they increase production. And in order to increase production, what do they need? They need additional materials to be delivered. So they start ordering additional stuff. And of course, that causes there to be this kind of vicious cycle where you've now got other suppliers kind of saying, oh, these guys are all ordering more. I better order more. And so this vicious circle is going on. What it has done is it has pushed everything into kind of over overdrive. And you're now in a situation where there's a massive problem in the supply chain. You've got ships, lorries, transport, fuel increases, just shortages everywhere, demand everywhere. And it's this totally unrealistic situation where supply and demand have just gone out, out of control. They've never been in this situation. And of course, shortages force people to respond by offering to pay more. So if you're, if you're trying to complete your project and somebody is saying, sorry, the price has you know, gone up, you know, either pay or wait. People will either say, okay, I'll just wait until it, you know, I need to maintain the same price or they will say, no, 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 I'll pay and they'll pay the extra. And that is where you start to see the price increases that I've noticed now with block layers and with various things, shipping containers, as I mentioned, it's total chaos out there. And we cannot get materials to site unless we, you know, do it weeks and weeks in advance, whereas it used to be, you know, uh, next day delivery. And so this is forcing people to kind of push up their prices as well. So inflation is creeping in there. And in the property market, it's very similar. You've got all of these housing projects that were stalled. You've got sales were stalled. You know, estate agents were not going out and doing viewings. And so properties were all put on hold and the sale of properties were put on hold. And yet there was still the number of people out there that would normally be buying continue to want to buy. So there's a big pent up demand. And suddenly all the housing sales are back on the market. The market has reopened. But suddenly because of the uh, the fact that everyone's been pent up and sitting at home, sitting on their hands, there's now two to three times the amount of buyers out there looking for the same property. And of course, that just naturally pushes up the price. So you're seeing big price jumps and big jumps make buyers that are kind of trying to get into the market panic because they start to think that, you know, they keep on losing. Every time they bid for a property, somebody outbids them. Being the underbidder a couple of times, you start to get kind of desperate. You can't, you suddenly start thinking you won't be able to afford the house that you were looking at last year. And uh, you start getting emotional. And you see these jumping prices, you see others outbidding you, and suddenly you're thinking, okay, I'm not going to get outbid. And you go in there and you bid more than everyone else. And so this is going on around the place. Everywhere you look, people are outbidding one another. I'm looking at properties and I'm seeing 40 people bidding on a property. You know, you would not have seen that two years ago. 
but suddenly 40, 50 people bidding on a single property naturally the property is going to go over budget over the asking price and in some cases we're seeing things you know more than two times the price that they were expecting to get and so then the people sitting on the sidelines that don't need a property are seeing the prices rising and they're getting FOMO and people are seeing their thinking to themselves geez look at the price rises I should get into the market of course when they jump in there's more buyers now so that'll just continue to push up the price and what you've got to understand here is that Currently, what's happening is this emotionally triggered price rise just because of the demand, the supply demand tension and the imbalance. And after 18 months of restrictions and savings and all that that have built up, it's like the perfect storm. And this is where it's often wise to kind of take a step back and just think for a moment, are you getting emotional here? And, you know, are you able to kind of just step back for a moment and just stop reacting and just think for, you know, think rationally about what is the situation? We've had 18 months of restrictions. Demand has been pent up for all that time. It's suddenly been released. There's a huge amount of savings in the market. And what happens, you know, using that same Coca-Cola bottle analogy, what happens when the bottle of Coke has exploded? You have, you know, 10, 15 seconds later, the, the bubbles die down. And when you actually open up that bottle of Coke, the fizz has gone out of it and it's, it's gone flat, basically. And the same thing, in my opinion, the same thing is going to happen here. You've got this massive current kind of spike in demand and everything like that. And what is going to happen is that the savings that everyone has you know, saved up, this huge big bubble in savings that, have, that everyone's talking about, that is going to get spent at some point. And when it, the prices will start to kind of fall back to what they should be or the spending patterns will fall back to what they should be. And when that happens, demand is going to drop back to the previous levels. When you drop back from you know this high sort of demand situation to previous levels, it's going to look like suddenly the, the market is, is falling back a bit. And during that, you know, during a crazy time when the prices shoot up so high, manufacturers, they also think, gosh, you know, we're going to have to double our capacity to serve all this demand. And they're going to suddenly find that all of this extra stuff that they have been building is no longer needed. And the stuff out there, uh, you know, there just isn't the same demand as there was. So this could actually lead to a reversal in the way everybody is looking at the market. And if you've been in a situation where you've been sitting on the sidelines watching all this, you're suddenly thinking to yourself, you know, I am missing out on all of this. But if you're a person who can kind of think rationally and think to yourself, no, no, this is just this huge spike. And then what's going to happen is it's going to fall back to normal. And then when it falls back to normal, I can get you know, back to normal myself. Now, something that I'm a little bit concerned about that could happen in the middle of all of this uncertainty and this kind of crazy situation that we're in is that we could get into a situation where in China that large developer Evergrande actually collapses and causes a, a kind of a big upset in China and China is one of basically the economic engines of the world and this is a bit of a concern to me because 27 percent of the Chinese economy is in real estate from what I've heard and read the mortgages is the big problem in China you've got here in Ireland, we can only borrow three and a half times our income. And, and then you're locked out. You can't get a mortgage above that. And because of central bank restrictions and stuff. Now, in the UK, I believe it's slightly higher. I think it's four and a half times is where the restrictions are. Now, these restrictions were brought in after the last crash because people were, you know, going crazy, buying way more than they could uh, afford. And then the market collapsed and they decided they didn't want to get into the situation where they had to prop up the banks. So they put the banks on all these restricted borrowing levels. Now, in China, that does not exist. Those levels of restrictions do not exist. And I've just been reading some statistics that like, I cannot get around my head around this. But the average mortgage level in China is currently 27 times your and they and obviously for it to be average there are you know there are lower levels i think the i think in parts of shanghai and stuff it's 18 times but in beijing and stuff i've heard that it's up to 49 times your income and so the average of 27 is is already crazy but can you imagine 49 times your annual earnings 
So if this all smells a little bit like the Lehman Brothers moment in 2008, then I think I'd agree with you. And I'm just a bit concerned that, you know, when Lehman Brothers collapsed, it was not this sudden moment that nobody saw coming. There was months and months of this kind of talk in the markets about, you know, there could be a problem on the, on the horizon. I can remember I was watching the, the news and I was listening to the, the forecasts and stuff and people were kind of saying, oh, this is the problem and this is a problem and this is a problem. And I can remember just having this gut feeling that there's definitely trouble coming and the, you know, the, the, the economy that's been running away and doing so well for so long has got to be running out of steam. So I started thinking it better, you know, maybe I should start preparing to get out of the market. And it took another while until Lehman Brothers actually did collapse. But when it collapsed, it was just a, like this domino effect. And it knocks down another, it, the other knocks down another, and it just basically has this kind of chain reaction. One bank is pulled down, one bank being pulled down pulls down another bank, pulls down another group of investors, and so on and so on, depending on how it's impacted. Now, the the size of the Evergrande situation, it's 300 billion uh, of borrowings. Now, I understand most of that is Chinese related debt and things like that. So that might be a good thing for the rest of the world, because at least you kind of think to yourself, the rest of the world won't suffer this. It'll be a Chinese sort of exclusive problem. Ultimately, if China catches this cold and the rest of the world gets pneumonia, this is something I just believe that a collapse of Evergrande could be kind of a trigger point, pulls the rest of the market down and, and maybe it causes the stock market to, to suddenly correct or something like that. But I'd be more worried about this kind of domino effect where there's like the chain reaction and one bank pulls down another bank and, and, the, and the collapse kind of continues to unravel. And if China does start to unravel, it could well impact the, the supply chain because so much of the, the world's products are made in China that if that market is badly impacted, you'd wonder whether that could actually cause all sorts of delays and things like that. And the supply chain issues could cause problems in the rest of the world. I'm just thinking about from, from the point of view of being a property investor, what would happen if you cannot get furniture for say six months you know normally you'd buy it and you know you get it delivered a couple of days later but what if ikea or whoever cannot deliver furniture for six months because of these problems you know will you be able to rent out your property if you've got no furniture in it good question what about if my development of houses that I, we're building at the moment what if we cannot get the windows because they are all sort of stuck in a docks uh, in China somewhere and we cannot get them shipped to us. And that's it. You know, we just can't complete the houses because we can't finish them while well, there's no windows. You start to kind of see how all of this could lead to some sort of a perfect storm where it all kind of goes badly wrong. And so question, how can you protect yourself from something like that taking place? The debate here is whether it's likely to take place. Some people might think that I'm being completely overreacting. Other people, people might be thinking, yeah, yeah, this is all possible. And it's not so much uh, like my point is not whether I'm right or wrong, the possibility of collapse and stuff. It's how to respond to the uncertainty around it. And so from my point of view, let me start by first of all reminding you that all of the media companies out there, like newspapers and television stations, they survive on advertising that they get. And so they need to grab your attention and surviving by grabbing your attention. How do they do that? Well, they do that with sensational headlines. And so every time you read, I look at the, I, I read, you know, various newspapers online and stuff, and I see these headlines and it's like global supply chain on the verge of collapse. This is the kind of headline you read or you know, you hear all these different ones and, and, and it's all sensational headlines make, made to grab your attention. And in the same way on, you know, YouTube and stuff like that, you have what we call clickbait. And it's the same thing. It's something that is kind of written in a way to grab your attention and make you kind of go, whoa, whoa, whoa what's this, you know? Anyway, there is a part of the brain called the, and the amygdala is this little bit of the brain that controls your response to any kind of fear or anxiety in the event that you're in danger. And it has been a part of the brain for like literally millions and millions of years. And it's, you know, very, very early part of the brain. It's not something that we've developed in recent years. It's actually been around since we were, 
you know, hunter gatherers living in caves and, and things like that. And where it saved us as human beings was if you were living in a cave and you heard a bear or a wolf, you were immediately alerted by your amygdala. And it was basically that the amygdala is the fight, the flight, the fight or flight response that you suddenly you wake up and you know either you have to run for it or you have to grab a spear and you have to fight this beast. And that is how we as a human you know, population survived in those days. We were constantly on the lookout for danger and we were constantly alerted to danger by the amygdala. Now, it worked great for early mankind. And um, the problem is, is that the modern world, we are inundated with all of these kind of information, newspaper headlines, all of this stuff that's kind of bombarding our eyeballs every day. And all of these people trying to get our attention, all these newspaper, media, influencers, everyone's trying to get your attention. And you, we are, the, the, the amygdala is unable to modulate the response. It's just, it just tells you this is danger or this is safe. This is danger or this is safe. And when you read a sort of a her- say a, a headline about a terror attack and in the same town that you live, you immediately overreact to that. You kind of think, oh my God, you know, this is, I'm in danger. I better stay indoors and all this. Now, the chances of you actually being attacked are very very slim but you still feel nervous and anxious and all that that's the amygdala at work and the amygdala also is at work when you you know newspaper headlines that talk about economic problems economic collapse also it works in the other way when you read that the economy is running like ahead of itself going crazy your amygdala also tells you to get fearful that you're missing out so that that fomo that i talk about fear of missing out That's the amygdala at work there. You read this headline that people are making millions of millions on crypto. You're immediately thinking, geez, I got to get into crypto because I don't want to miss out on this bonanza that everyone else is in. That is the amygdala at work. And what you've got to remember is it's triggering your emotions. You have no control over that unless you're able to stop and just check yourself for a moment and think, hold on a second. Am I reacting rationally here or is this my amygdala basically pulling the strings. It's a big problem because we we basically, we are emotional beings and it works both ways. So if you see prices rising quickly, you're going to be worried about missing out and just you, you could actually end up overpaying. Equally, if you start to see negative signs, if you start to see you know a correction in the market, the likelihood is you'll overreact to that and you'll probably try to sell your property and you'll probably try to get out. And that's how markets fall. It's big herd mentality. Markets rise, all rise together because everyone is buying. When suddenly somebody, you know, who's influential or something happens that spooks the market, suddenly everyone is running for the exit at the same time. And if you've ever been in a football pitch or something like that, everyone, when the match is over, everyone decides to leave. How quickly can you get out of that football stadium? If you had decided to leave 10 minutes before the match was over, you'd be out of your car in five minutes. If you wait until the game is over, everybody's trying to leave at the same time. You'll be, what, 30 minutes trying to get back to your car? That is the same thing that happens in the markets. And, you know, everyone wants to pile in. Everyone wants to pile out at the same time. When everyone wants to pile in, prices get driven up. When everyone wants to get out, prices get driven back down. So you've got to protect yourself by just bearing this in mind, bearing in mind at all times that the emotional response in your mind, that fear of missing out or that overreaction to fear, that is going to happen across the market. Everyone else is doing it as well. And you've got to think to yourself, hold on a second, Do I? should I respond like this? What happens if I just sit back and do nothing and let everyone else run for the hills? They'll all, you know, the, the market will fall in value and maybe I can step in, I can pick up lots of bargains afterwards. Equally, when the market is going crazy, you can sort of sit in the sidelines and say, no, I'm not buying, I'm not overpaying for this property. I'm not overpaying for these stocks and shares. I'm not overpaying for this crypto, whatever it might be that you're investing in. You just have to be careful that you are not getting caught up. And if you ignore your emotions, you forget to think rationally, you're going to be taken advantage of by the market. And as Warren Buffett is famous for saying, when others are greedy, that is the time to be fearful. And then the opposite of that also applies. And that is that when others are fearful, that is the time that you want to get really greedy. 
And um, in practical terms right now, today, I would say there's too much uncertainty to make a definitive decision one way or another. We're looking at the market running away with itself, but then there is huge demand because of the lack of houses being built. And so it's, it's you know, I don't, I'm not going to recommend you sit in the sidelines and do nothing. I do think you need to continue looking for opportunities, but I do think you need to be very disciplined and just remain kind of rational and always be looking at the different valuations out there, the comparables, and just keep on looking at the income versus the, you know, the debt that you're, you're taking on board. Can you afford it? I mean, does the cash flow cover your borrowings if the debt were to, say, say your interest rates were to increase by 30 or 40 percent, like would you be caught by that or would you find yourself still, you know, maybe not making any money, but maybe not negative because that is a big problem. And you might sit back and say, you know, actually, I'm just going to sit back and do nothing. Well, sit, sitting back and doing nothing is also a, a, a risk because inflation is here and you're going to have a situation where the value of your capital continues to fall every year that you do nothing. So if you decide to sit back and do nothing, you could actually find that you've missed out on a 30% increase in the market. And, you know, that is going to feel pretty bad if you suddenly realize, whoa, the market's not coming back. It's actually keeping, it's going to keep on going. And that is where you just have to be a little bit careful and cautious and just remove the emotion. Just make sure you're not overpaying, but make sure equally that you're not so fearful that you're actually avoiding doing anything at all and that you're not in a situation like if you're going to go and buy a property, just evaluate the, the income versus the, the cost of debt and what is the likelihood of the market actually pushing up. With inflation, usually there are interest rates that come along with inflation. And when in interest rates increase, your borrowing is going to go up and you can get caught badly on that. And then you can suddenly find that you're unable to afford your payments. And that is going to force you to have to sell the property and maybe you have to sell the property into a falling market. And if you're full, if you're paying in, definitely if their interest rates increase, you're going to have a lot of people who are in the same boat, unable to afford it, and they'll all be putting the property on the market. And in the same way, you have huge demand at the moment pushing up prices. You're going to have huge supply. If everyone is putting their property on the market because they can't afford the interest, you're going to have huge falls. So you just need to make sure that you are remaining disciplined and patient and just don't let your emotions cloud your judgment. Keep looking at the payments and just the ability to afford and just be aware of the swing in sentiment then if, if anything does change. When the current demand falls back, you're going to have, you know, changes in the, in the sentiment in the market. You're going to have people suddenly saying, oh, I told you so, the market is falling now. You don't want to be the person who's also kind of running for the hills. You just want to make sure that you are sort of sitting there and you're kind of oblivious to, not oblivious, but you're completely, I suppose, just unemotional about it. You just, you're, you're reading the, the, the signals in the market, you're looking at it and you're just, you know, you are what you are. You're just sitting there and you're just reading it and you're sort of saying, okay, I can, you know, I can still figure out whether or not this is a good investment. I can still, I can still proceed if I have to proceed and I can still walk away and I'm just not going to overpay for the property. And that's the most important thing. Just don't overreact. Check yourself, check your feelings of anxiety are you legitimately fearful or are you overreacting to headlines? Are you overreacting to friends who are talking about issues? Who are you listening to? You've always just got to be careful where, the, where you're getting your news from. Newspapers, remember, are trying to sell newspapers by making these scary headlines. And so just be aware of your emotions at all times. And, uh, and keep looking for those opportunities. You just might be lucky. And there's always people out there who will have a motivation to sell that is not connected to some sort of a market, you know, sentiment. They might need to sell because there's been a bereavement in the family or something like that. The motivation may be unconnected to the market and you may be able to do a deal with that person that is that correlated to falls or rises and you just find a good deal there. All right, guys, I hope you found this helpful. Please let me know if you have any kind of alternative opinions on all of this. I'm always interested to know and I hope to speak to you all soon. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Behind the Facade. If you enjoyed it or found it useful, please take a moment to leave a review over on iTunes 
or indeed share it with a friend. It really helps grow the podcast and reach more people. If you have any questions or topics you would like me to cover in future episodes, please connect with me via my Facebook group, Behind the Facade Community. Alternatively, you will always find me on social media by my handle, Gavin J. Gallagher. You can stay up to date with all the projects I'm working on by joining my tribe. Do that by adding your name and email over at gavinjgallagher.com. That's all for now, folks. See you back here next week. Mm -hmm.